Well, welcome back out. We're at the orbital launch site of Starbase, and it's Wednesday, the 12th of April, 2023. And a lot of changes, a lot of exciting items have happened over the last 24 hours. So I thought I'd come back out here and try to give you a glimpse of what is going on. One of the things that you can tell right off the bat is something has changed with the booster and the Starship right behind me. Late last night, they de-stacked the Starship and sometimes you might think that that was a bad thing but in this case it's a, a really really great sign of things to come now they had stacked the ship and the booster together without installing the flight termination system earlier and they did that because they wanted to do some more tests and ensure that everything was ready to go and also waiting for the FAA launch clearance now we still don't have the official FAA launch license to launch but there's a lot of indications that that is forthcoming maybe uh, in the next day or two so by having SpaceX decide to destack bring the Starship down to the ground level is a great sign because where it was they couldn't reach the flight termination system uh, installation point on the Starship so by making the decision and bringing the Starship down to the ground that's a really big deal and it really indicates that uh, SpaceX is confident that they're going to get that launch license soon also very recently as you can see by this screenshot as of this afternoon on the SpaceX official website they post that the Starship should launch at least the target date is Monday the 17th of April that's always subject to change but I think that's another really great indicator that SpaceX is gearing up for the launch in addition to that very recently on their website as you can see by these series of images they posted information about the countdown up to the launch and various milestones that will happen throughout that period of time roughly starting two hours before the launch all the way up to the T0 point they also have the post launch milestone list that takes you from launch all the way through max Q to the booster separation and then the return of the booster to the Gulf of Mexico about 20 kilometers just to the east of where I'm standing and also the continuing on the flight trajectory for the Starship and if all goes well it would do a splashdown just northeast of Kauai of the Hawaiian Islands so really need to see these post and pre countdown milestones that uh, has been posted on SpaceX's site in addition to that as you can see by this image they've posted a graphic of how all of that should work if everything goes well now keep in mind this is a prototype it's the first launch of its kind there are bound to be things that go wrong maybe don't quite hit the milestones so uh, I think SpaceX has been very upfront with that by saying expect a, a lot of uh, very interesting I think they call it excitement uh, from the launch forward but I think that if they get through maximum dynamic pressure and they get to the booster separation they may call that a success and then everything after that is just bonus most of the point here is to collect data and getting that launch through these milestones is really the objective of this test so i really hope that this does uh, come to fruition and they are able to do the launch on monday if they scrub or if they have issues then they have the rest of the week already scheduled out to try again so be ready for that to happen so I'm going to relocate to a different vantage point and talk a little bit more about some of the Starship, some of the things that are very interesting about these particular vehicles behind me, and uh, just some more information. So let's move to a different site. All right, so I've relocated now a little bit to the east, closer to the Gulf of Mexico to give you a slightly different vantage point on how the Starship, the booster, and the orbital launch facility looks today after they did the D-Stack. Now, a couple other things that I wanna talk about uh, has to do with at least what I've been hearing and also what I think myself about this particular booster and ship and why I think SpaceX is interested in getting this launched as soon as possible. Now the Booster 7 here is pretty much the last of its kind 
Um, it has the hydraulic thrust vector controls for the engines for the gimballing and that differs significantly from the next generation of booster which is now booster 9 that went to electric thrust vector uh, uh, control. So they can get a lot of data from the flight of this particular booster and most of the dynamics as far as aerodynamics how it does the boost back and the burn to try to do the landing however the data that they may need for the electric thrust vector controls they really won't be getting that from this booster so what i think is that they really want to get this launched and moved off of the plate so that they can move forward with their next designs Similarly with Ship 24, it does have some of the older kinds of uh, construction processes and uh, I think they also have uh, hydraulic thrust vector controls for the center engines. I believe that the new ships, which I think is going to start with Ship 26 now, which is over at the production facility, actually at the uh, Rocket Garden on a specialized stand where they're getting the engines already installed and some other preparation work, I think that that is going to be the next generation. So once again, SpaceX, I believe, really wants to get this ship and this booster launched so that they can put this behind them and start moving on towards the next design. While I'm in this location, I want to talk a little bit more about these tanks that you see behind me. Now these tanks were constructed here on site by SpaceX and they use similar processes to the actual Starship itself as far as the materials and the welding. These tanks contain liquid nitrogen, liquid oxygen, and behind them on the ground some prefabricated tanks that they brought in from off-site has the methane. Now the Starship is a methyl ox or methane oxygen propelled vehicle and it's going to need quite a bit of the materials uh, in these tanks to be able to prepare for and do the launch. And I believe it's somewhere around 5,000 tons worth of propellant once it's fully loaded, which is an enormous amount. Now the amount of the materials that can be stored in these tanks, as I understand it, is a little less than one and a half starships uh, worth of the materials. Now you may think that that's more than enough for the launch, and generally it would be. However, because these are cryogenics, they have a tendency to boil off just because of the temperature differences between outside here and the temperatures of the cryogenic fluids. Because of that, they have to continually replenish these throughout the launch up until the moment that the engines are lit and the rocket leaves the pad. Now also, if for some reason during the countdown they have a scrub, they can recycle a lot of the material that is inside the Starship and the booster back into these tanks. But because of that boil off, they're going to lose a certain percentage of that. Could be as much as 20% of the entire propellant and that would be the oxygen, the methane to some degree, and also the nitrogen. So what they are doing here is at the suborbital site, which is on the other end of this uh, launch site, they have other tanks that they've used for previous rocket tests, and they are currently filling them up with also the nitrogen, oxygen, and possibly the methane. The reason why I think that they're doing that is it gives them a ready storage on site in case they do the scrub and then they're able to recycle over the next day or so because it's going to take a time for them to bring the trucks in from off site to replenish these tanks behind me. So it looks like SpaceX has some strategies to try to minimize the impact of any scrubs and try to get the launch done next week if at all possible. So I'm going to relocate down to the south end of this facility where the suborbital launch facilities are and show you some of the activity down there. So I've moved a little bit uh, further towards the center part of the orbital test and launch facility and what I wanted to show you here behind me is parts of the suborbital uh, test site that uh, they have here uh, on uh, Boca Chica. Now you can see that the crane has been lifted vertically. Yesterday it was down horizontally. It looks like they were doing some of the uh, gear uh, change out towards the top of the 
uh, the crane. I'm not sure exactly why, but it's possible that they need it in operation temporarily until they get to the uh, launch attempt next week. But also behind me, you can see one of the two suborbital launch platforms, and this played a role in some of the early tests, and specifically SN5 and 6, which were the tests of essentially the tank section of the Starship and launching and landing nearby with just a single Raptor engine. That later on uh, morphed into testing the full Starship from SN8 all the way through SN15, resulting in SN15 successful launch flip and the landing, which is pretty cool. That's led us to the long road to this launch attempt with the booster and Starship stacked together. Nearby also here is the venerable Starship Hopper. Uh, that was the first test article using the first variation of the Raptors. That vehicle did actually fly here. It flew in July 2019, so it's been nearly four years. And it's amazing to just think of the progress SpaceX has made between Hopper and what we're seeing on the pad now for the full stack launch. So let me show you a little bit of the sights and sound around this portion of the launch facility today on Wednesday, hopefully just a few days before the launch attempt next week. So that's going to wrap it up for this episode of my tour here at Starbase. And as I mentioned and what we talked about, a lot of exciting changes in just the last 24 hours. Much of it is based on some information that we're getting about hopefully the first test launch attempt coming up early next week. Also, hopefully that we're going to hear about the FAA launch license soon. That's a critical part of making this happen. The fact that the ship has been destacked for that flight termination system is another great sign. And also, as we talked about a little earlier, I believe that uh, SpaceX is really incentivized to trying to get this to launch, not only because they want to get the data from this particular launch to help influence the designs of future iterations, but also because these represent the older generation already and they want to have this completed so that they can move on. And I think that that may be one of the biggest reasons that they're really pushing now to try to get this launched coming up soon. And if all goes well, we'll be able to see that launch in just a few days. As always, thank you very much for watching. I do appreciate it, and I hope that you found that this information and this tour here at Starbase was helpful and informative. So stay tuned for the next episode coming up.